Did you ever have that show that you watched religiously as a child? Was there ever a series that glued your eyes to the screen whenever it came on? Was there a time you could just sit down and watch that show for hours and never get bored? Well, if you did, do you ever distinctly remember the day you decided to watch it again, and it turned out to be a bit different than you remembered? It was the same show that you saw when you were younger, of course, but something about it seemed off. Something wasn't clicking for you the same way it used to. And you ultimately had to reach the conclusion you'd been running from for too long. This show's fucking shit! Did you ever revisit the same show years after that, and realize that it may not have been as bad as your younger self thought it was, and that possibly your younger, younger self may have been onto something? Did you ever decide to make a YouTube video on that same show? This started a lot more relatable than it ended up, so I'm just gonna cut it right there, but all that was leading up to... Who remembers Dinosaur King? I don't blame you if you don't, it doesn't seem like too many have any recollection of this show. Well, no one notable anyway. Of course, as with any anime, I'm sure if you search up Dinosaur King AMV, you're sure to come across something. But I don't know if that's a solid indicator of a show hitting the big leagues. It's like judging a show's success off of whether or not any results come up for it on Rule 34. I wonder if anything does come up for Dinosaur King. Oh my god! But aside from that, I've heard absolutely nothing about the show from any major or semi-major faces on the internet, and it seems like a mostly forgotten property. I know it must have some fans for these AMVs to exist, and for this to exist. And I'm sure there's some Dinosaur King subreddit that's just fuming right now at me excluding them from this discussion. I have no proof, but I just get a feeling. While I'll get into some of the general history later, let's first start with my personal history with Dinosaur King and how I discovered it. As a kid, I was a huge dinosaur nut. Still am, but when I was younger, I couldn't get enough of them. I watched tons of pivot animations from back in the day, those claymation Fred the Dinosaur Man videos, those were some of my favorites. And when I was really young, like four or five, I couldn't go to YouTube for this stuff, so often my parents had to find things that would give me my dinosaur fix. I plan on talking about some of the silly dinosaur documentaries I watched as a kid, but let's tackle one thing at a time here. Besides, it wasn't all bad. My parents looking for things to satiate my prehistory obsessions, but led to them discovering things like walking with dinosaurs, which is one of my favorite documentaries ever, easily my favorite dinosaur documentary, like, without a doubt. But on the opposite end of things, it led to me watching stuff like Dinosaur King. Dinosaur King is an anime series that originally aired on Nagoya TV and TV Ashi in Japan, with the first season running from early 2007 to early 2008, and a second season running from winter to summer of 2008. The series revolves around the adventures of the D-Team, a group of three kids and their allies, and their dinosaurs, which can transform into cards and also baby dinosaurs, and they basically have superpowers, pretty much kind of. That's the Cliff Notes version of the first couple of episodes, but obviously there's more to say than that. Still, it should give you a little taste of how simultaneously weird and derivative this show is. I mean, the basic premise of kids going around collecting cards certainly sounds similar to Pokemon, and the fact that both properties started as video games and then spun off into anime series and trading cards, it just kinda adds on to the similarities. The funny thing about all this is that I never really got into Pokemon, but what's crazy is that maybe in an alternate universe, I could have if I wasn't busy watching its dinosaur knockoff. As said, Dinosaur King did originate as a video game, an arcade game to be exact, by Sega released back in 2005, which eventually spun off into the aforementioned trading card game in 2008, but sandwiched in between both releases was the anime television series. The series was animated by Sunrise, which is a name anime fans might be familiar with, as they're the studio responsible for Cowboy Bebop, Inuyasha, Mobile Suit Gundam, among many, many, many others. It is worth noting, however, that Sunrise has had multiple studios to which they outsource their animation. So while shows like Mobile Suit Gundam and Inuyasha were animated at Studio 1, and Cowboy Bebop at Studio 2, Dinosaur King was sent to Studio 10. Make of that what you will. Also, yes, as this is an anime series, and I started watching it well before I saw anything else from, related to, or having anything to do with Japanese animation, this would technically make this show my first anime. Yeah, well, you were all off watching your your Dragon Ball Zs and your your Sailor Moons and your 
Pokemons, and hey, let's go back a bit even further. Maybe your Akira's and your Ninja Scrolls? I was watching Dinosaur King! Of course, for me to watch it, the show would also be localized into English territories, where it was given a dub by four kids, which is not only what I watched as a kid, but also what I used for this review since, well, honestly, it's all I could find. I wasn't about to shell out more money than I needed to just to watch the show subbed. Besides, this dub isn't all that bad, hell, by four kids' standards, it's downright masterful. They don't even try to hide us from the horror of rice balls. With the US production being done at four kids, some of the voice actors might be familiar to some of you who grew up on shows like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Sonic X, and the four kids TMNT series. I'll get into more detailed character profiles later, but for now, here's just a brief rundown of some of the cast members. Veronica Taylor voices the main character, Max Taylor, and his mom, Aki. Taylor is probably best known for being the first English voice of Ash Ketchum on Pokemon, as well as voicing April O'Neil in the 2003 Ninja Turtles series. She also voiced a ton of other characters in a lot of other anime series, but if you want to see another dinosaur-related project she was in, there's always Speckles the Tarvosaurus, aka Dino King. Rachel Lillis voices Ursula, Reese, and Laura, so she certainly had to work it out for on the show. Lilith is probably best known for her several roles in the Pokemon series, including Misty, Jesse, and Chigglypuff. Can't imagine voicing a Pokemon as a very demanding job, but an impressive range of characters nonetheless. David Wills voices Max's dad, Spike Taylor, and Ed. Wills has been in... uh... a bunch of stuff, but a couple of roles I recognize him from are as 80s Splinter and Mirage Shredder in the TMNT 2003 finale, Turtles Forever. Sean Schemmel, who's probably best known as the current and longest serving English voice of Goku on Dragon Ball Z, voices Dr. Owen, and I also heard his name in the background of a lot of the episodes, so he's pretty much all over this show. Darren Dunstan, who voices Xander, also voice directed this series as well as countless other anime series, and he's yet another Ninja Turtles voice actor, having voiced Splinter in TMNT 2003. And finally, we have Dan Green, voice of Knuckles the Echidna and Yugi from Yu-Gi-Oh, voicing Jonathan. More on all these characters in a bit, but first, I've got to set the stage for how this review is going to go. Here's the deal. I'm not going through this series episode by episode, or in any sort of chronological order. I'll give a brief synopsis towards the end, but most of this video will be me going over the various elements of the series like characters, animation, recurring themes, or other miscellaneous details, and giving my opinion on them little by little. If you want a full, episodic breakdown for the entire series, this isn't it, but Hopefully you'll enjoy this non-linear look at the show, and all its various facets, starting with... Alright, so... why? Well, because the theme song and intro are important for setting the tone of the show. In this case, if the tone you want to set is bright, campy kids show, with some dangerous elements to keep the kiddies engaged, you've mostly succeeded if this is what you turned in. The song starts off a bit intense, but quickly transitions into light and cheerful, the visuals reflect everything the song is talking about, and the song is decently catchy, it's not bad for what it is. But this is still a 2004 kids anime theme song, so you know... Rapping. Watch out, here we go, prehistoric dinosaurs aren't extinct anymore. See them fight, hear a roar, watch out cause they're right next door. Okay, I don't get it. What about this was meant to appeal to kids? I assume that's the only reason they did stuff like this back in the day. It's the same reason we had shit like this in the 90s. Just an attempt to appear cool, but what kid in the late 2000s, or any time for that matter, is gonna listen to this and say, oh yeah. I wasn't on board until the rap part, but now that that's come in, I'm all in. Seriously, no one is gonna be getting down to Dinosaur King. Watch out, here we go, prehistoric dinosaurs aren't extinct anymore, see them fight, hear a roar, watch out cause they're right next door. Also, it might seem trivial to critique the lyrics of the Dinosaur King song, but I'm just pointing this out to you. These fossils are colossal! Well, if they're alive, they're not really fossils anymore, now are they? But all this is fine. The rest of the song is as upbeat and fun as the show often is, so I got no real complaints here. I might even catch myself singing it every now and then and not hate myself for it. Truly praise of the highest order, I know, but we have bigger fish to fry. Make your move, come on, make your move. 
Getting into the characters, I first have to point out that there are about a million one-off or minor characters whose impact on the story is roughly zero, but I obviously can't go over all of them, so we'll only be focusing on the main cast, with some supporting players thrown in that I feel are worth mentioning. Which also includes the dinosaurs, by the way. It's worth noting that the 4Kids dub changed all the names, which some could see as a localization faux pas, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. I'll just be sticking to their English names since, again, I watched the dub, I know, crucify me, but let's start with the D-Team. Maximus Max Taylor, voiced as previously mentioned by Veronica Taylor, is the de facto leader of the D-Team and pretty much the main character of the series. Kind of. I don't know. Both he and Rex seem to be on pretty equal footing with each other as far as who's the real main character. I'll talk about that more when I get to Rex though. As far as a protagonist goes, Max is okay, but kind of basic. All the characters are basic, I mean we're not expecting masterful character writing here, but Max just feels like a baseline main leader character, which is all I really expected. One thing I can commend them for is that they didn't make Max overly perfect. He's not the brightest bulb in the socket, he can be impulsive, brash, overly emotional, you know, like a kid. And all that's much better than if he was an infallible Gary Stu type who never messed up. And it makes watching him a lot less of a chore because it's not a guarantee that he'll know exactly what to do. He's certainly fallible in his fashion, that's for sure. Apparently those horns on his visor are lights, and we do see him use them as such from time to time, but these moments are sparse, so he mostly just spends the series with these goofy looking horns on his head that don't appear to serve any purpose. I guess he could try to stab a bitch with them, but that'd probably be too extreme for a kid show. Also, someone should really tell him to lower his fanny pack. I don't think they're supposed to go up that high. Regardless, Max is just fine as the main character. Nothing exceptional, but certainly likable enough to carry his show, and not so devoid of personality or suish that he becomes difficult to watch, so he's alright for the most part. Max's dinosaur is a yellow triceratops named Chomp because he likes chomping things, and because he bit Max's nose in the first episode, and likes biting his ass. Okay. Chomp also happens to be the first dinosaur seen in this entire series, and one of only two who were there since episode one. All the dinosaurs in this show are attuned to some sort of element or natural phenomenon which dictates their powers, and in Chomp's case, it's lightning. So all his powers and moves involve lightning this and thunder that, and he appears to be the strongest of the D-Team's dinosaurs, being most likely to physically match this or that dinosaur in combat. Rex Owen, I guess you could consider the Deuteragonist, but I almost feel like that doesn't do him justice. A large chunk of the show's first season is kind of all about Rex, and in the other episodes, he receives a fair bit of focus, so I think it's reasonable to just consider him another protagonist alongside Max. Rex is one of the more enjoyable characters in the series. He's got a fairly interesting backstory that lends a bit more depth to him than I was anticipating, and his characterization isn't bad either. When first introduced, he's just sort of a friend of Max, but also kind of serves as his foil. While Max is a born leader, loud and as heroic as he can muster, Rex is a bit more understated and doesn't wear his heart on his sleeve as much. Look, even their colors contrast each other. With how different these two are, it's a wonder why they're even friends, but I guess they just find a way to make it all work out. For you see, while one takes two steps forward, the other takes two steps back. But they come together, cause opposites attract. Also worth noting, Rex is the only one of the three main characters to have a defined age, sort of. The episode The Big Apple Grapple shows the characters celebrating Rex's 12th birthday, kind of. So before that episode, he was 11, in a sense. This brings me to, in my opinion, one of the failings of the English dub of the show. Rex is voiced by Sebastian Arcellus, and his voice just sounds too old for a character who hasn't even hit puberty yet. What makes this especially confusing is that Max, who I guess is meant to be around the same age, is voiced by a woman. This is a tried and true method in voice acting, to have a little boy be voiced by an adult woman, present in shows and characters such as... Honestly, take your pick. Why Rex wasn't given the same treatment, I don't know. It's not as if Arcellus does a bad job, and after a while I did get used to it, it's just kinda weird. Speaking of weird, you might wonder why I was saying things like sort of and in a sense when talking about his age. That's because Rex... Should I really just explain all this now? 
screw it. I'm doing it anyway. Rex was actually born in the late Cretaceous period, right around when the dinosaurs became extinct. You see, his parents, Dr. Ancient and Cretacea, were time-traveling paleontologists who, along with Dr. Z and the Alpha Gang, are the reasons the dinosaurs can turn into cards and were scattered all over the world in the present time. All this is revealed by the character of Jonathan, who is a guardian android of sorts sent back in time to watch over Rex and the Alpha Gang, and not only trying to collect the cards, but also trying to get back to the correct time period. <sighs> you got all that? Good, now I don't have to repeat it when I get to the Alpha Gang. Rex's dinosaur, first acquired in episode 2, is a blue Carnotaurus named Ace. Ace, I remember being my favorite of the d types dinosaurs, and watching the show years later, yeah, I see why. I think at the time the only reason was because Ace was the only carnivorous d team dinosaur, and I liked carnivores more than herbivores. I was like five, give me a break. Now, I think he's cool for other reasons. For one, he's a Carnotaurus. Those were some of the coolest dinosaurs that ever lived, and considering the surge in popularity they're experiencing at the moment, I have to say it was a little ahead of its time for the show to have a Carnotaurus as one of its main dinosaur stars. The second reason why Ace is the best, he's blue. Dark blue, specifically. Need I go on? And third, his powers are all wind-based. Okay, so that's gonna have to knock him down a couple points, cause FUCK WIND! But it looks cool, I guess, so I suppose I can let it go. And rounding out our trio of prepubescent protagonists is Zoe Drake, voiced by Kether Donahue, who, unlike Rex, does seem to be attempting a younger sounding voice, but her main way of going about it just seems to be pitching it up a little and giving it more of a. ooooey sound to it. I am terrible at articulating my point if that's the best I could come up with. Anyway, from what I understand, Zoe isn't in the original arcade game. She's a show-specific edition, making the D-Team a trio instead of a duo. And she is the girl one! Okay, it's not that bad. She does have some character beyond just girl, but it is telling that of the three main leads, she feels like the one who has the least amount of individual focus put on her. Not that she needs it, I suppose. It's kind of an ensemble after all, and even the three main characters are seldom seen separated, so I'll get off my soapbox for now. Zoe is sort of a balancing element between the other two leads, the rationalist of the group, being neither excessively ostentatious nor excessively subdued. Again, this could be seen as a symptom of her being the girl, since it's an often easy bit of characterization to make the lone female of the group the only one with a clue in her head, but that's not the case here. She's certainly no killjoy, which I'm happy about, since her being the voice of reason would make it easy to just make her humorless and a spoil sport, but she isn't, and she's not suey in any way. But all in all, from a character standpoint, she's a little flat, but so is Max, and I mean, Rex is probably the one with the most depth, and even then, it's nothing major. So while the D-team as a whole are a bit nondescript as far as their characters go, they still make for a fairly solid trio of protagonists that I didn't mind following for a season or two. Also, I feel a bit icky for even feeling the need to mention this, but here goes. I have to say, for an underage anime character, they showed surprising restraint in not overly sexualizing her. Wow! Though that may be because she's meant to be about 12, which I think is a little too young even over there, and okay. The fact that it's a little young over there is kind of... I mean... Cultural differences. And while I say that they showed restraint, I still think that outfit might turn a few heads, though mainly for how ridiculous it looks. It's as if exaggerated 80s fashion and exaggerated 2000s punk fashion made passionate love together. Zoe also first uses her dinosaur in episode 2, a Parasaurolophus named Paris. Uh... Anyway, Paris is a green Parasaurolophus, and the D-team's only female dinosaur. Go figure. As a kid, I didn't care for Paris much. Go figure. Not just because she was a girl, but because she was also a Hadrosaur. Those are some of my least favorite dinosaurs, they just didn't seem that interesting to me. Now, I've come around to them a bit more and can appreciate them for the wonderful animals that they were, and perhaps as a consequence, I did find myself liking Paris more this time around. Like with all the dinosaurs, she's aligned with a certain element, which in her case is grass. And she can shoot grass at her allies to heal them. 
smoke weed every day. Come on, that was too obvious for me not to do. Now, let's talk about some of the villains in this show, starting with the Alpha Gang. More specifically, the main trio of nitwits who are most often referred to as the Alpha Gang. Beginning with Ursula. This green-haired bimbo. <laughs> Jesus. This green-haired woman is the closest thing to a leader these morons have, and is the typical conceited diva who's just a little too infatuated with herself. She's not horrible though, and it's nice of this show to give her all these attributes but not make her overly annoying to watch, thank god. Like, you can communicate that she's a drama queen without actually making her aggravating to an audience member. Besides, she gets some funny moments as well. A lot of it, though, I think comes from Rachel Lillis' performance. She really manages to make a lot of this dialogue sound less stiff and, for lack of a better term, anime-y than some other dubs I've heard, so that's a plus. Overall, she's fine. Not my favorite, but her interactions with the other members of the team and with the D-team do make her somewhat enjoyable. Though, she does have a really overplayed gag associated with her that I'll come to in a bit. Unlike the D-Team, the Alpha Gang doesn't have a corresponding dinosaur for each member of the team. They swap dinosaurs all the time, but there are still some that I associate with certain members more than others, and with Ursula, that is Terry. Now, I don't know if you can believe this, but as a dinosaur fan, I'm kind of fond of Tyrannosaurus Rex. And now this will come as a big shock. T-Rex is very popular, so it's really a no-brainer that they included said dinosaur as one of the main dinosaurs in this show, and boy did they ever do the Tyrant Lizard justice! A fiery red T-Rex with fire and lava powers possibly beating out Ace as my favorite dinosaur in the show? Yeah, they give T-Rex its due diligence. Every time Terry is brought out, you know the Alpha Gang means business, and all his powers and attacks? So cool. Figuratively, of course. Ace and Terry are neck and neck for me in terms of being my favorite of the main six dinosaurs, probably just because I really like T-Rex and Carnotaurus. Well, what can I say? Continuing along, let's go to Xander, and that Xander isn't short for anything since it's spelled with a Z. Yeah, 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 this is Xander, not Xander as in Alexander. No, just Xander as in what a four-year-old hearing Xander for the first time would probably write down. This is a kid's show, so that seems about right. Anyway, Xander is kind of a foppish, honestly just plain odd fellow who maybe was intended to play off Ed's antics a bit more, but both of them just seem pretty dense a lot of the time. Not that Ursula is a genius, but she really does herself in by associating with these bozos. Also, Xander's whole character design is just kind of odd. He's wearing these rounded sunglasses all the time, like we never see him without them. Maximum douchebag! And his odd cowlick style hairdo, not the best fashion sense for someone who I just described as foppish, but I'm certain he thinks he looks badass, so eh. Also, a final note about Xander, he develops a crush on Reese later in the show, and after it's introduced, you'd think they'd make it more of a thing, but instead they bring it up maybe a couple of times afterward throughout the entire rest of the series, so that's some nice pointless filler for you. I'd prefer if this was never a thing at all, but if you had to make a reoccurring element out of it, you might want to put more effort into actually making it reoccurring. Not having it established in one episode and then dropped until they randomly decide to have it appear again like two more times and then be done with it. Just a thought. Xander's my least favorite of the Alpha Gang trio. He stands out the least and has the least amount of funny moments associated with him. I don't blame the others for forgetting about him at one point. Xander's main dinosaur, kinda sorta maybe, is Spiny, a Spinosaurus. What a creative name. I think they may have just given up on naming Terry and Spiny. Speaking of Terry and Spiny, you know they just couldn't resist having them fight at least once, even though they're on the same team, but I do like that they even bothered to include Spinosaurus on the show at the time. Like with Carnotaurus, I think Spinosaurus has been going through something of a renaissance in recent times, so it was a bit forward thinking of the show to include one back in 2007. I really like Spiny's color scheme, kind of a subdued stone gray with a purple highlighted back. It might be one of the more realistic color schemes in all honesty, and of course, as a Spinosaurus, he has all water-based powers. Of course, with the show premiering seven years before a certain discovery having something to do with Spinosaurus' legs, no short-legged Spinosaurus here, but if anyone wants to do a redesign with Spiny with more accurate proportions and leg structure, that'd be cool. Rounding out our second trio of the evening is Ed, and right off the bat, I'm gonna compliment the show some more for having Ed be a portly gentleman and not making that his whole character or reducing him to just the fat one. 
that's nice. While that isn't just the fat one, he, along with Xander, is little more than the foil to Ursula. The main conflict between these three seems to be that Xander and Ed are morons, Ursula's a drama queen, and the three still insist on staying together throughout all their missions. This is a toxic work environment if they're forced to stay together. I mean, that shouldn't come as a shock since it's run by Dr. Z of all people, but maybe sending out these guys separately would yield better results. There does seem to be a lot of infighting between them. Of course, in this show, we can't have the bad guys winning too much anyway, so they'd all find ways to individually fuck it up somehow, I'm sure. Ed, to me, even though he and Xander are kind of interchangeable idiots a lot of the time, I find to be a bit more entertaining. I just think he has a bit more funny lines that actually work, and while Xander has a stupid-ass subplot that leads nowhere, Ed has nothing of the sort. In fact, he might be the character with some of the least individual focus put on him, even for one-off episodes. I can't think of any Ed episodes off the top of my head, but honestly, I don't think he needs them. Ed's alright, not my favorite, but certainly a decent member of the cast, has some funny scenes associated with him, mostly having to do with his interactions with Xander, and there's some of the rare moments where Xander rises above his usual persona, and it's only when interacting with another character. How about that? Ed's dinosaur, once again, not really, is a Cychania named Tank. I'm kind of stunned that the show elected to have a Cychania as its main Ankylosaurus as opposed to, well, Ankylosaurus. There is an Ankylosaurus later in the series, but that's just a one-off thing and not a mainstay dinosaur. Tank is. Sorta. Yeah, even though the Alpha Gang technically has three dinosaurs, in practice it feels more like they have two since Tank isn't brought out a whole lot, and even when she is, she kinda sucks. Tank is the most underpowered dinosaur in this whole series. She's an ankylosaur. She should be badass, but instead, she's useless. It's almost hard to watch, like ankylosaur blackface or something. Not the best representation of one of the coolest types of dinosaurs that ever lived, so yeah. Not a fan of Tank. Dr. Z, the mad scientist ostensibly running this whole operation, and easily one of my favorite characters in the entire series. He pulls off zany, wacky professor guy so well. He's also where the title of the show comes from. Yeah, his goal in this series is to become Dinosaur King. Hence why the show is called... Dinosaur King. Now, how he plans to become Dinosaur King isn't entirely clear. I think they explained what his plan was at some point, maybe, but none of that really matters, it's just his evil plan for the series. Speaking of evil, I like how this series actually makes it seem like Dr. Z should be the villain. What I mean by that is that sometimes, especially in kids cartoons where they can't show too much violence or cruelty, you just kinda have to go with it that the person who the show says is a bad guy is a bad guy. Here, Dr. Z isn't just the bad guy, he's also a bad guy. It's heavily implied that he's being unethical in his treatment towards the dinosaurs, which would constitute animal cruelty, I'd imagine. Sure, all this isn't presented in grueling detail, but it's implied, and it's the reason the D-team is even against him from the beginning. Besides, if animal abuse isn't enough to condemn him, his ridiculous taste in eyebrows probably should. But who gives a shit if he's an implied animal abuser when he's just so lovable? I guess it's more a love-to-hate-him deal at that point, possibly the highest honor a villain can achieve. Once again, his voice acting in the dub is fantastic. It's Eric Stewart doing the voice, and his performance and inflections add a lot to this character. You can just tell this guy was having a blast voicing him. Or maybe he wasn't at all, and it was just an... Act. <laughs> I don't know if that was worthy of that, but whatever. On to more serious matters. Seth, voiced by Mark Thompson, is one of the more interesting elements of this series. When first introduced near the beginning of this series, actually the first episode I think, Seth is used very sparingly, only making occasional appearances here and there. However, towards the end of the first season, he takes on a much more active role in the series, eventually making his way up to well, the main villain of the show, pretty much. Right alongside Dr. Z, if not more so. Now that I think about it, Dr. Z and the Alpha Gang are kinda red herrings when you take a step back and look at the whole season. Like, yeah, they're goofy and incompetent and not the least bit threatening, but you at least know they're the main villains. Or do you? 
It's pretty much Seth who's the real mastermind. He's much more of a mad scientist than Dr. Z ever was, and while they're initially in on the same plan, it's Seth who ends up acting against the Doctor and has his own agenda. Unlike all the other villains in the show, he's also pretty much played totally straight and isn't constantly used as a punchline. Seth is ruthless, manipulative, kind of creepy and mysterious. He's everything the other villains aren't, and it's ultimately his scheme that forces the D-Team and Alpha Gang to put aside their differences and try and take him down. There's yet another area where I gotta compliment the dub. Seth's voice in the English version of this show matches perfectly with how he's portrayed, capturing that authoritative aspect of the character while not forgetting his more conniving nature. Whenever this guy speaks, joke time's over. Time to be serious. I, I mean, as serious as you can be looking like that, but even then, that's kind of intimidating. I mean, what is that, a futuristic trench coat? Oh, he's not gonna flash anybody. That'd push him over the edge of villainy. To me, Seth is one of the strongest aspects of the show's first season. Seeing him undergo his transition from an unassuming background character to a cunning, scheming, ultimate villain is actually somewhat compelling to see play out, and I appreciate his role in the show and how his presence helps give it a bit more oomph and higher stakes than it would have without him. Moving on to a character that does nothing for drama or stakes, but I don't care. It's Helga! Now, this is a character that really grew on me upon my most recent rewatch. As I remember, I couldn't stand her as a kid, but watching back now, I can't get enough of her. Helga is the maid at Zeta Point, the Alpha Gang secret base, by the way, and is probably the scariest thing on that island, dinosaurs included. She's like, the real, real boss. I said Seth was a true mastermind, but even he knows better than to get in Helga's way. Every scene with her is a treat, and it's another example of the dub really nailing a character's presence through their voice. Helga's voice acted in the show by Maddie Blaustein, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who portrays her with a... German accent, I suppose? I think that's what it is, but whatever accent, her voice just kills me. Like with Dr. Z, you could tell the VA had a lot of fun voicing this character, and it most definitely shows. She just perfectly captures that stern, strict, but goofily so nature of this character, and to add on to all that, she could be pretty badass, especially towards the end of the season. It's in the episode Mythical Mix-Up that she's revealed to be an android, and from then on, Terminator Helga is out in full force, and she just kicks everyone's ass taking in the last four to five episodes, but we'll get to that. But rounding out the Alpha Gang, we have Dr. Z's grandkids, Rod and Laura. Laura, I've already said, is voiced by Rachel Lillis, while Rod is voiced by Zoe Martin. Like Seth, these two start off as somewhat nothing characters, but eventually grow into much more prominent and active characters in the story. Fitting, seeing how it's Seth who brings them into that. In the beginning, they just seem like a couple of bratty kids, accentuated in a later episode where they appear to help out the D-Team, only to actually be ratting them out to the Alpha Gang, showing that these two might just be kids, but they are still Dr. Z's grandkids. Meaning they're a couple of little shits. But later, the show goes out of its way to still show their humanity. Just a few short scenes of Laura saying how much she misses her parents since she didn't plan on the last time she saw them, being the last time she might ever see them, Little stuff like that isn't a ton, but it doesn't go unnoticed. Certainly not by Seth, anyway. Laura, in particular, not only is later able to stand on her own, but also helps show off just how much of a bastard Seth is with his nonchalant manipulation of her, also didn't get this little girl to do his dirty work for him rather than doing it himself. It's really fucked up now that I think about it. Oh, you're worried about your grandfather? Well, get me this card and maybe we'll talk. That is an abridged version of a conversation these two characters have. Enough of Seth, though, because as for these two on their own, I like how it's them who are the first ones to turn to the D-Team side, and they ultimately have to convince the rest of the Alpha Gang to help them out against Seth, and how this doesn't come out of nowhere, as they've been more lenient in the past on the D-Team than the rest of the Alpha Gang, so it makes some sense. I found myself liking these two more and more as the season went on, and it just goes to show that sometimes the slow burn to you warming up to a character or characters is worth it. One additional entry for the Alpha Gang, the Alpha Droids. They aren't really characters, but they're a humanoid and they're part of the bad guy's army, so I can kind of include them. Honestly, there's not much to say. They're like the foot soldiers from the 87 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show, or the battle droids from the Star Wars prequels. Humanoid robots who are deployed in large hordes and serve as little more than cannon fodder and comic relief. 
Okay, let's keep going. Moving past the main factions, let's get into some of the allies of the D-Team throughout this series. Starting with Spike Taylor, Max's dad. His main role in the show is that he's a fucking loser. Okay, that's a little harsh, but... Wait, is it? Yeah, a lot of the humor around him is putting up this front of being this great paleontologist, this outdoorsman who knows how to lasso and shit, but he's actually a complete fuck-up at everything he's ever tried to do. Also, it's funny how the Taylor's house is actually in Japan, that's been shown a number of times throughout the series, so assuming that Taylor is Japanese, which is much harder to believe when you use the English names, but I've come this far with them, so I'm gonna stick to it. That'd mean he's... Eh, just play the clip. Hello. My name is Cowboy Tanaka. Not gonna lie, Taylor is not one of my favorites in this whole group. He's fine as an every once in a while comic relief type character, but he's just in the show way too much I feel, and a lot of his antics fall into the stupid moronic category rather than the funny kind. Still, he has his moments, and I like that while he's portrayed as something of a doofus, they didn't make him out to be an unlikable jackass or anything. He seems like a decent dad at least, albeit something of a goofball. It also can't be easy for him considering that he has two kids. Yeah, that's right, I implied Rex is his kid. If not by blood, Taylor is certainly the closest thing to a reliable parental figure Rex has. The poor kid can't seem to catch a break when it comes to absentee parents. Yes, we'll get to all of that later. But on to more family of the D-Team, who is also allies of said team. Reese, Zoe's sister. I'll be honest, Reese being Zoe's sister kind of betrays how little I may have paid attention to the show when I was a kid, because up until starting work on this video, I had no idea they were even related. I guess I just never put it together as a kid, but to be fair, I was done no favors by the show itself. I mean, look at these two, I think you can understand why this didn't click with me at the time. And that's not even mentioning how one sister is 12, give or take, and the other is what, like 25? Those Drake parents, they do not have kids on an impulse, so I'll give them that. Anyway, Reese is head of the D-Lab and supplier of much of the D-Team's equipment, though that only comes around once in a while. She's mostly an exposition vessel. It's nice that, for having a somewhat thankless role in the series most of the time, they managed to make the scenes with Reese actually kind of fun to watch. She's got this kind of aloof persona with a fitting, monotonic voice to boot, rarely raising said voice or getting angry, or any emotion for that matter. I think the most the show ever did to display any kind of anger was showing the glare in her glasses. Maybe I just have a soft spot for these kinds of characters, the sort of distant, unemotional types. Don't know what that says about me, not important. But I really liked Reese in this show. She was one of those characters who didn't have a ton to do, but whenever she got an expanded role in the series, it was always a treat. I prefer her to his sister, to be honest, and unlike her sister, I don't think she's underage. I say think because this is an anime, so I could be way off. You can just never be too sure of these things, can you? Aki, Max's mom, plays the role of the oblivious everyday person in the series. She's just a totally average person who has nothing to do with any of this dinosaur business, and is just trying to be a good mom to her two sons, and a good wife, and all that stuff, and isn't and shouldn't be involved in any of the Alpha Gang schemes. She's too pure for it. I feel like the style of character has been done a lot in stories that have larger than life elements taking place in the real world, or at least a somewhat normal and realistic world, save for all the fantastical elements. You got this average person who's just totally detached from all the crazy crap that's happening around them, and sometimes might not even know what any of it is. Like here, she doesn't even realize the dinosaurs are, well, dinosaurs. She thinks they're dogs. I mean, she only ever sees them in their baby form, so I guess it's reasonable then, but... Uh, wait, 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 what the hell kind of dogs look like this? I mean, let's just take Chomp for example. Our most modern scientific understanding of what a baby Triceratops might have looked like has them looking something like this. Would you ever confuse that for a dog? I'm just saying, it seems a little implausible. I mean, the show has just been so realistic until now, but this shit? It's just a bridge too far, I'm afraid. Anyway, I didn't have much to say about Aki since she's not a super major character, but I wanted to fit her in. I kind of like how completely detached she is from all this mayhem going on around her. Plus, she's just really sweet and easygoing, and that's cool. Hope she's not spoiling her kids too much, though. Oh, speaking of which, I should probably talk about this guy. Dr. Rowan is... Rex's dad? I mean... Honestly, he's the guy who found Rex as a baby after he was sent back in time, but aside from that, he has almost nothing to do with him. He's not even his dad in the sense that he may not be his real father. 
But he was therefore more than his real dad ever was, since that's more Dr. Taylor's MO. This guy's just the person who Rex refers to as dad. Yeah, that's about as far as we get with him. He's always on some dig or something, but whenever he does appear, he's never too afraid to get down with Dr. Taylor, even if it has to happen through screens. He also gets this colleague come episode 30 named Patrick, who is, oh my god, is this offensive or is it just stupid? Should I care? I suppose not. It's not worth anyone getting their panties in a bunch over. Dr. Rowan also has this stupid, dumbass, fucking lame, stupid as shit subplot where he falls in love with Ursula and it's terrible. It's not funny. Thank god they only referenced it a few times afterwards because it was bad. Honestly, I can't say much about this guy since he's not too prominent a character, but he sure is there, and Rex sure does call him his dad, even if he probably doesn't deserve it. Oh my god, I just realized they didn't talk about Zoe's parents. Eh, talked about her sister. That's enough for now. I'll save the parents for season two. The last character to talk about for now is Jonathan. Now, this guy is an interesting case. He actually shows up quite early in the show, but is probably this series' most blatant example of something seemingly unremarkable becoming something, well, not amazing, but certainly weird later on. Jonathan shows up a bunch in these early episodes, and every time he does, he's got a different occupation. First, he's a pilot, then he's sitting in a park with a book of dinosaur cards, then he's a conductor, and that's just a few examples. Eventually, though, he's revealed to be an android who was sent back in time to protect Rex. I went over all that when I talked about Rex, but what I didn't tell you is that he can swivel his head around, and that this bearded look is not his natural look. But this is. You can kinda tell that he was designed the opposite way, right? Cause this doesn't look like an upside down head, but this most certainly does. Oh, and he and Seth have a fight on top of a train. I only mention this because it's one of the few human on, well, humanoid action scenes we get in the show, and it did, I mean, it's, it's, it's all right, nothing special, but it's good to see them trying something different. Now, Jonathan's whole character in the show is something a little different since this isn't the type of show you'd expect androids from, but he and Helga are the exceptions, and yeah, it's kind of nice to see Jonathan being so devoted to protecting Rex. He's like the T-800 to Rex's John Connor, only here both the protector and protect ego back in time, but I'll be honest, Jonathan is not one of my favorites in the series, and I liked him better when he had his head turned upside down. Now I'm not going to be too long on this segment, since unlike story and characters and things that I feel I have something of a grasp on when it comes to critiquing them, Animation is something I'm fairly in the dark about, and I can't just really properly articulate how I feel like I can with other topics. Any schmuck can tell you what good and bad animation looks like. Someone who understands animation more than the average person can tell you what makes it good, or even what makes it worse. With all that said, I think the animation here is fine. The 2D animation is nothing to write home about, seems perfectly acceptable for what it is. There are some annoying cheats I noticed, particularly in the first few episodes. Like, they'll just have a still frame or a single cell that they move up and down the frame with. That's a bit annoying. Aside from those shortcuts, though, this looks okay. The battle animations, I'll call them, when the characters summon their dinosaurs or use a move card, are some of the nicest looking bits of animation in the show. I guess whoever animated these decided, well, the audience is going to be seeing these enough, might as well make them look as good as we can. And they did. Undeniably, these look pretty good, but some of them kind of go overboard with it, like it almost looks like it was animated by a different studio or something. A good example is Zoe's Metal Wing animation, which is a move card, I'll talk about those in a bit, that allows her to summon a trio of pteranodons and just look at it. That's some trigger shit right there is all I'm saying. But aside from those standouts, the 2D animation is just kind of fine. The 3D animation of the dinosaurs, however, is actually pretty good and blends well with the 2D backdrops and characters. I can't quite explain it, but I really like how they blended the 2D and 3D elements together and actually made them look natural and not have one overly contrast or stand out from the other. As much as it would have been neat to see the dinosaurs rendered in traditional animation, it's cool that they went for this different style, almost as if to show somehow that they're out of their element or something, I don't know. But this aspect of the show looks good, and from my uninformed point of view, certainly does a good job of integrating these two animation styles. Okay, enough of being out of my depth, let's get back to what I know. 
all of these are things that I noticed popping up every now and then that I couldn't find another specific category for, so I just grouped them in here. I'm gonna run through these pretty fast, so you best pay attention if you want to get the full picture. Dino Holders and Alpha Scanners. These are the devices used by the D-Team and Alpha Gang respectively to summon their dinosaurs and activate move cards. They're at the series, they'll get upgraded, modified, lost, found again, all that good stuff. Oh, and would you look at that, I can even buy one on eBay for $200! Wow, what a steal! The D-Lab, Reese's Lab, the exterior of which is shaped like a Triceratops head, and is the location of the teleporter along with much of the other gear that Reese engineers. I don't really know how she affords all this, guess her parents are just really successful veterinarians, or maybe she herself is just a successful dino holder engineer. You got me at how she has all this. As mentioned, the D-Lab is also the home of the teleporter that allows the D-Team to instantly travel to their location of choice. Apparently it only works for those who wield a dino holder. Don't know how that works, but I guess Reese designed it that way, but it renders it proprietary. I guess they can't have any old schmuck just teleporting willy-nilly. Fair enough. Zeta Point, the Alpha Gang's moving, artificial island slash base of operations, which is later revealed to be a time machine. Yeah, really. It's got everything an evil genius would ever need on a tropical island fortress, only here it was entirely his creation. And maybe a little bit of Dr. Ancient Cretacea, but they're not in the season until the end, so it's just Dr. Z's for now. Shake a Bone Stew, not a very regular, but nevertheless reoccurring gag. It's a bunch of dinosaur bones Dr. Z throws onto a map to decide where to look for the next dinosaur card. It somehow actually works whenever he does it and sends the Alpha Gang in the right direction. Maybe Dr. Z is psychic, or the bones have a mind of their own? Or both? Who cares, it's just an easy way to get the Doctor to send out the gang on their mission. Oh god, this one. This is the played out gag I was alluding to when I talked about Ursula. In almost every episode, we always have to have at least one of the kids, usually Zoe, call Ursula an old lady. And then she freaks out. That's the joke. If this was something they did maybe once every few episodes or so, then I guess it'd be fine, but every single one? Sometimes multiple times in one episode? It's a bit excessive, don't you think? Something doesn't have to happen every episode for it to be a running joke, and they just went totally overboard with this one. It wasn't even that funny the first time they did it, but after 43 episodes of this shit happening in every single one? I was worn out by it, honestly. As for another Alpha Gang gag that, in this case, was thankfully retired fairly early on, is where an Alpha Gang gadget would be destroyed, followed by Xander remarking that it was on his credit card. It's set up as a running joke in the first few episodes, but then they just drop it. Fine by me, I'd rather have a joke come up a few times not be all that funny than a one show up every damn episode and be beaten into the ground. Now here's something that's less of a running gag and more just a recurring humorous element. The dinosaurs, in their baby forms, are confused slash passed off as dogs. It first happens with that key, and she's the one to believe it for the longest time, but it happens to other characters too, and it's not that bad. It's not played out, they don't resort to it every episode, it's just something that comes up every now and then, but isn't so frequent that you forget it even exists. Good on you, show. That's how you do a recurring gag. You figured it out. Good for you. Move cards. These are special cards that don't just contain a dinosaur, but instead a power-up slash special ability of some kind, sometimes involving another dinosaur or prehistoric creature. I mentioned how one move card, Metal Wing, has some stunning animation associated with it for Zoe's summoning of it, but there are plenty of other move cards too. Too many to go over here though, so we'll continue onward too. Time Portals, an odd recurring element in which a dinosaur battle will sometimes send the characters back in time? Or possibly show them a projection of the past? I don't think they ever really explain it, and even with time travel becoming a thing later in the series, this weird little discrepancy goes completely unexplained. Unless I missed something. Oh well, too late now. Time Portals! These obviously aren't all the recurring elements in this show, but they're the ones I felt like pointing out, so I did. Now, let's get back to the meat and potatoes once more. Alright, so I'm not going to go through every single episode in depth because that'd take too long and there's not really any 
point. Even though there is some continuity between the episodes, and not every one of them just forgets that the others happened, they're not serialized in the sense that every episode picks up immediately where the last one left off. It's not that kind of show. You get some multi-parters now and then, but for the most part, the plots are pretty contained with the occasional Remember in this episode when this happened moment? Consider this a summary. A taste of what the show is like, with some standout episodes pointed out as I see fit. I should also point out that the season 1 playlist I found on YouTube, uploaded by the official 4Kids YouTube channel by the way, relax, actually has some of the episodes missing. Those episodes being episodes 18, 21, 31, 39, 43, and 44. If these are like the best episodes and I'm missing out big time by not watching them, please tell me because I couldn't find them anywhere. But I think 43 out of 49 episodes is still enough for me to get the gist of the show. I mean, 43 out of 49? That's like 87% of the overall show? Like like a B plus? That's, that's pretty good. Of course, for season 2, I got a 100%. That means I improved. The series begins with Max Taylor waking up one morning to see a meteor falling from the sky and landing in the forests near his house. After traveling into the woods with his friends, Rex Owen and Zoe Drake, they find the crash site as well as a strange stone and card near it. Discovering that the stone can summon a Triceratops, which Max names Chomp, it isn't long before Max is found in pursuit by a Tyrannosaurus named Terry, which is being controlled by the Alpha Gang and the mad scientist Dr. Z. Chomp manages to defeat Terry, but by the second episode, a Spinosaurus has also been discovered. While traveling to Egypt, hoping to get there before the Alpha Gang does, Max manages to meet up with Rex and Zoe, who instead traveled via teleporter, courtesy of Zoe's sister Reese, and also now have dinosaurs of their own, which they use to defeat the Alpha Gang's dinosaurs, though the latter does manage to get a hold of the Spinosaurus card. And from there, the stage is pretty much set. There's one more episode with the Alpha Gang acquired tank, thus completing their main trio of dinosaurs, kind of but not really. But from there, the series delves into episodic, Monster of the Week style storytelling with a still kind of overarching plot that only really becomes important within the last five episodes or so. Pretty soon, the series establishes a pattern. Almost every episode from here on out has a similar setup, and it goes something like this. Episode starts with an egg slash card being uncovered and a new dinosaur being released. Then we cut to the Taylor's house where some sort of inane shite is happening that'll come into play later in the same story. D-Team catches wind of the dinosaur card and travels to specified location with Alpha Gang either following suit or arriving independently of the D-Team. D-Team and Alpha Gang meet up in battle for a bit, you know, hijinks ensue and all that, and Zoe calls Ursula an old lady. Eventually, the new dinosaur is incapacitated and the card is collected by the D-Team, while the Alpha Gang end up in some sort of embarrassing predicament. Obviously, all these episodes find some way to dress this formula up differently so it doesn't get stale. Sometimes they even let the Alpha Gang get the card instead. But the basic setup is the same, just a new dinosaur in a new location, but outside of that, almost everything is the same. And it's not a bad formula, it's just very clearly there from the beginning. There are a few episodes that I like from the first 10 or so episodes. I like the episode featuring Mayasora and how it doesn't show the featured dinosaur as inherently malevolent or evil, but rather just as a territorial mother looking out for its egg. So that's one highlight. The first episode that really stood out to me as being anything particularly special besides that though is the show's first two-parter, Alpha Zeta Point and Escape from Zeta Point. This episode, or episodes, was really the first time when watching the series that it finally felt like something was happening. All the other episodes before these two had been relatively light, fluffy affairs with not a whole lot going on. These episodes, while still goofy, it felt like something was finally developing within the series. It starts pretty similarly to the preceding episodes, with some kind of setup at the Taylor's house that'll come back at the end of the story, but then it continues with the D-Team discovering the Alpha Gang's secret base, getting trapped on said island, getting caught and having their dino holders taken from them by the Alpha Gang, the episode then ends on a cliffhanger, and the next one is all about them, well, escaping from Zeta Point. They get their dino holders back, they make it back to the surface, and the whole thing climaxes with a four-way battle between the D-Team and Alpha Gang's dinosaurs, with the D-Team ultimately escaping thanks to some last-minute intervention by Reese. I was actually surprised by how much I got into these episodes. For the first time when watching the show, I felt genuinely excited, invested, and thoroughly entertained by Dinosaur King. This two-parter is a real highlight for the season, and what makes it great is that a lot of what is established here actually comes back into play later, in an even bigger and better way than before. For now, we still got the rest of the season to talk about though. Everything from episodes 14 all the way to 45, and that stuff is… okay. 
Some of it may be even a little more than okay, but let's get into it. There are definitely episodes post the Zeta Point story that stood out to me, but a lot of them just sort of follow the formula that was established in the earlier episodes without it seeming like any real progress is being made. Of course, there is, because the cards are being collected, but there's only so much I can say about these episodes since they all do the same thing. That doesn't mean they're bad, of course, it just means that there isn't much to talk about. But there are a few exceptions. Some of the episodes are only worth noting simply for how stupid they are. There's an episode called Field of Screams, where an Alturinus appears in Brazil, and while out searching for it, the D-team gets sidetracked playing a soccer game, and the episode ends with a dinosaur soccer match. <laughs> God. Or how about the epic saga of Dr. Z throwing his back out, which is almost entirely pointless and lasts like five episodes. I thought it was just going to be a one-off thing, but no, this plot thread goes on for a while. And it's not like Seth really needed the doc to be incapacitated in order to continue his scheme. It's not relevant and mostly just leads to some dumb jokes and that's about it. Oh, and almost forgot the episode Lights, Camera, Destruction, where the gang travels to Hollywood to see Dr. Rowan serving as the chief scientific advisor on a dinosaur movie directed by... Stanley... Spinoberg. Oh, what's that? You didn't get the reference? Don't worry, they'll keep hammering it in. Also, while this character invokes the name of a certain other director, he's much more of a Michael Bay type, having no respect for Dr. Owen's vision and simply wanting to make more spectacle. Ooh, the evil movie director not understanding true artistry. How cliche, how cliche. Hey, I got an idea for you guys. Maybe he should have had another episode where they go back to Hollywood to fight an evil movie producer named, uh, Harry Spinestein, who just uncovered a Raptosaurus card. That's a real thing, look it up. Don't give me any of that crap about how it's actually pronounced Rapitosaurus or something like that, because you know what? It's a fucking joke. But outside of those really silly episodes, you have episodes that are just as silly, but far more entertaining and even exciting in their silliness. Episodes like All Fired Up about a fire-shooting, souped-up Acrocanthosaurus, or Daddy Dearest about a fight with a Therizinosaurus up a building, provide the fun dinosaur action that the series is oddly lacking a lot of the time, while ones like Just Plain Crazy actually have a really good setup for which the action takes place. In that episode, Reese has plans to take the kids up on a plane, but both Max and Zoe have to step away, and when trouble breaks loose, it's up to them to prevent Reese and Rex from crashing, as the Alpha Gang is up to no good. It's like Die Hard 2, but with dinosaurs. Then you just have episodes that are pretty standard, but have certain moments in them that vary from advancing the story to just being fucking weird. Like this one from an episode called Ninja Nightmare. You're beautiful. <laughs> huh? Well, he may not sound like one, but he certainly has the romance skills of a 12-year-old. There's also a Christmas episode, which is always fun, and this one is also a Rod and Laura-focused outing, which we definitely started seeing more of as the season trudged onward. And that leads us pretty well into the ending. This four-parter finale shows the writers truly stepping up their game and throwing their all into making a satisfying, action-packed storyline to end off the season with. And they pass with flying colors, in my opinion. I already mentioned all the stuff with Rex's parents, and Jonathan, and how Seth is really the main bad guy, but I think it's impressive how it all ties together. Considering that a lot of this information is taken care of in one exposition dump from Jonathan, I got surprisingly into it. You see, Seth's whole plot in this show is to change the course of history by hyper-evolving dinosaurs, and making it so that they never go extinct, or some shit. It's actually a bit more of a nuanced plan than just, I want to destroy the world, or some shit. He's using time travel and unethical dinosaur experiments to alter the course of history, and that's pretty evil, as well as being absolutely insane. But while the specifics of Seth's plot aren't too important, what is important is how they tie everything together and make it feel like this is what the show was building up to. Seth's black T-Rex, a giant black tyrannosaur that dwarfs the other dinosaurs, is a really cool idea and seeing it battle so many of the different dinosaurs from all throughout the season is phenomenal. We also get to see androids Helga and Jonathan kicking ass and that's just a treat. We even get to see Dr. Taylor being competent for once. Everyone gets their moments to shine. Every character gets at least one scene or contribution to make in the battle against the villain. If that's not a hallmark of a good final battle, 
I don't know what is. And it all concludes with Max, seemingly defeated by Seth, being saved by Chomp, who even in his baby form is still able to help thwart Seth's plan and allow Max to break free and finally vanquish Seth once and for all. Pretty definitively, I might add. Like, even if he survived that, who knows where he ended up getting sucked into that time vortex. From there, Rex's birth parents return, they take Rex and the cars back to their correct time periods, Zoe and Max say goodbye to Chomp in Paris, and the 21st century folk watch from the Taylor house as the time machine returns from whence it came. What a conclusive ending that was. <coughs> oh no. Please. I don't even have an excuse not to watch season 2, because season 1 ended on a cliffhanger. Here's the deal. I'll finish the series. I'll talk about season 2. I'm doing it in this video. I'm none of that two-parter nonsense. Not, not for now, anyway. But, I'm gonna need to take a little bit of a breather. So, enemy will return after these messages. <laughs> we now return to enemy. Alright, let's talk about season two. Unlike season one, I really don't remember seeing any of these episodes when I was younger, so this was an entirely new experience for me. And it was... well, let's take one thing at a time here. Because before I can get into summarizing the rest of the plot of this series, there are a few more characters and reoccurring elements present in the season that I didn't go over when talking about season one. There are also some changes made in the roles of existing characters, with many forced to take a backseat for the new story. Some of that sidelining is more regrettable than others, so before I go any further, let's go over some of these season to season changes, and then we'll get back to the summary of the plot. First, we've got some new characters this season, chief among them being the Spectral Space Pirates, the new villains of the show. Who are they? Well, they're pirates, they're in space, but don't ask me what Spectral is, cause I don't know. Anyway, as the new main bad guys this season, you'd hope they'd be a step up and improve upon what was established in Season 1. Well, bury those hopes, because what we get instead are cheap knockoffs. Let's start with Gabbro. This big red ugly fuck is the first of the Spectral Space Pirates to make an appearance in this show. His whole deal is that he's denser than a black hole. In fact, his whole mind could just be one black hole of stupidity. Our running gag with him is that he doesn't understand idioms and always takes figures of speech at face value, so maybe Spectre has just been serving Gabbro too many Asperger's aboard their ship. But he's also got this dopey voice that just paints this picture of idiocy, though nothing about how he sounds or what I say about him can paint a picture of idiocy quite like this still frame. This tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> Oh, and his hilarious flying animation. That ought to do it too. Fool's Cap, yes, that's his name, great job for kids, is another member of the Space Pirates who I have even less to say about than I did about Gabbro. Fool's Cap's most notable trait is in the English dub, having a voice that sounds like a cross between Skeletor and Squidward. I'll find that Cosmo Stone if I have to tear this place apart. It's somewhere close now, I can feel it! Aside from that, he's just some pointy-chinned scrawny motherfucker who only appears less stupid by proxy compared to Gabbro. He's still an absolute moron, though. Sheer is the lone female of the three spectral space pirates, and their boss, I guess. And her main identifying feature is that she's, like, totally over this. She just doesn't give a heck about anything in the whole wide world. She doesn't care about the D-team, or the parents, or even the other space pirates. She's just too epic for all that. But in all seriousness, she just feels like Ursula 2 point blow without any of the comedy or entertainment value that made that character even slightly redeemable. The only thing that makes me like Sheer is that she appears to hate the other two space pirates, which gives her something in common with me, so nice to see some similarity there. You'll also notice that for these three, I didn't introduce any of their main dinosaurs because they have no main dinosaurs. We're constantly getting new dinosaurs dropped on us nearly every single episode, and they usually show up maybe once or twice, and then are never seen or heard from again. I know season one had a lot of dinosaurs too, but those were only meant as one-off Monster of the Week deals. Throughout, you still had a consistent trio of dinosaurs on both sides that you could get used to and learn the strengths and weaknesses of. 
Here, it's like the space pirates have an infinite supply of dinosaurs that they just keep pulling from out of their ass. This just screams a marketing ploy to introduce as many new dinosaur toys as possible. But they better have been some damn good toys if they're just gonna sacrifice us knowing who the hell these dinosaurs are for them. The one exception to not having a consistent dinosaur is the head honcho of the space pirates, Spectre, who has an apatosaurus named Bronticans. Spectre is probably my favorite of the space pirates, so of course he's in at the least. When first introduced, he's just the mysterious boss of the space pirates, but as we see more of him in full, it becomes obvious he's just another goofball villain. But not in the same way as Dr. Z, in a way that makes them seem too similar. Spectre more so just doesn't seem to take anything seriously, including this show. He's clearly enjoying his job as a space pirate captain, and is constantly being humorously affable and jokey, but still maintaining a level of seriousness when his subordinates fail him, as well as being a terrible singer. He's a pretty decent character and works well as a humorous main villain, but it makes me wish that the parent ceiling was the main conflict in this season. The Cosmo Stones Spectre wants seem unnecessary, and just feel like they're there because we needed something to one-up the cards from the last season, and have a reason to bring Seth back. Speaking of which, Seth is back in the show, and I'm not a huge fan of that. I said that he worked well in the first season as a surprise main villain, but that doesn't mean I needed to see him again here, especially since his role in the season just feels similar to the last one. Yet again, we have him mysteriously working in the shadows, where he ultimately plans to double-cross the bad guys and take whatever they're after to use for his own nefarious purposes. The only difference here is that he notices the error of his ways this time around, which could have been interesting, except that it's all forced into the last 10 minutes of the final episode, so not much time to develop that. Before he redeems himself, though, the only good thing I can say about his role in the season is how he just double-crosses everyone. He is totally on his own team for this entire season, he just goes back and forth from betraying one faction to immediately spinning around and betraying another one. Yeah, Seth's still the same old Seth we knew from last time, but I'd be fine if he just wasn't here. Someone I'm glad is still around though is Dr. Z, who is just as entertaining as ever and thankfully doesn't lose any of his luster now that he's not a bad guy anymore. If anything, I like him even more here than I did in Season 1. The rest of the Alpha Gang are unfortunately not so lucky. Now that they don't serve as much of a source of conflict anymore, their scenes now just feel like pointless fluff to fill episode time. It's padding. Like, the definition of padding. The old lady gag is also back with a vengeance and cranked up to the absolute highest it can go. It doesn't even make sense anymore. Like, in the first season, Ursula would usually be around when someone called her old so that she could hear them, and if she couldn't, then it would only be implied that maybe she knew someone said it. Here, she is literally psychic. She can sense when someone is calling her old from miles away, which could be a funny escalation of the joke, but it's not funny. Yeah, the Alpha Gang Sans Dr. Z feel like they've overstayed their welcome by now, and might have just preferred the season without them. At the very least, you could just leave them in the present with Reese, Rod, and Laura. Speaking of which, one of the more egregious examples of characters sidelining in the season is having Reese, Rod, and Laura, right from the beginning, be left behind in the present and only able to communicate with the D-Team very infrequently and for mere moments at a time. Even then, it usually just boils down to Reese saying, Hey sis, you found our parents yet? No? Oh, alright then. Whoop, breaking up again. <laughs> I'm no fan of this development, as it means basically taking some of my favorite characters from last season and just kicking them out of the story for the most part. It's especially frustrating with Rod and Laura, as they're two characters who really grew on me as they became more proactive in the story last season, and I was excited to see them involved with the action right from the beginning this time. But that didn't happen. Instead, they're stuck at the D-Lab hanging out with Reese almost the entire time, which I'm just not a fan of at all. Dr. Owen and Patrick are also there with them, and as for Max and Zoe's parents, well, they're on the space pirate ship for most of the season and we don't get to see a lot of them. Which is fine, since Dr. Taylor I was kind of tired of by the end of the first season anyway, and all the other parents weren't in the show all that much to begin with. Hell, I think Zoe and Reese's parents actually have a larger role here than they did last time. But what really stood out to me is how little Dr. Ancient and Cretacea are in this show. For how much of the first season was building up to them finally showing up and seeing their son again, and now as soon as they do that, they get taken away again. Now, they're at least not inconsequential, they still have importance to the story since they're both being forced to work for Spectre, but they're once again just not in it a lot. Although it might be better this way, since Dr. Ancient is just a 
block of wood as far as his character goes. And Gratatia is weird. I don't know. I think they may have run out of personalities and didn't know what to do with these two, and that's why they're not in it much. Speaking of not in this much, Helga's barely in this show now, and that upsets me since she was one of my favorite characters. Even more upsetting is the news associated with Helga this season. You see, Helga's original voice actor in the English dub, Maddie Blostein, actually passed away during production of the second season, and was replaced on the show by Mike Pollock voice of Dr. Eggman from Sonic. Pollock does a good job, and Shree would have been fine if he had been given more time. As is, Helga's role has been drastically reduced in this series, and I do not like it. There's not much to say about the other characters, the D-team hasn't been tampered with in any drastic way, and Jonathan is… still here, but that takes care of the characters, new and old. We've also got some new reoccurring elements in this series to go over, so let's get started with the Dino Bracers. These are the replacement for the Dino Holders, engineered by Reese in Episode 1. They are wrist-mounted devices rather than handheld, basically the equivalent of going from an iPhone to an Apple Watch. Aside from that, they function essentially the same, but one thing that isn't the same is the new animations for the Dino Bracers. Yes, and yet again, it's some of the best looking animation in the series. Though, I will admit, they may be going a bit overboard at this point. These animations are so rubbery, they begin looking like Reed Richards. Also, Zoe's animation is a tiny bit hard to watch. Nothing too bad, just a little more ass than I bargained for with this character. On the topic of animation, though, one thing I will say is that I think the dinosaur battles are better this season than they were in Season 1. Season 1 was surprisingly lacking in really high-octane action, but this season I think does a little better with it, aided in part by the Spectral Armor and Dinotector, futuristic armor that the Space Pirates and later D-Team and Alpha Gang used to strengthen their dinosaurs. At first, I really didn't like this idea. It seemed like it was going a little too far in trying to make the dinosaurs seem cooler, but I eventually got used to it, and I will even admit that it does make them look a little more badass. Good on ya. Okay, this is a weird one. A strange, ethereal-looking pterosaur that appears in Episode 1 to guide the D-Team throughout all of space and time to complete their quest. Once again, it's an example of the season being a bit more out there than its predecessor, and in this instance, it's in a good way. I think the pterosaur looks cool, even if its function mainly seems to be, you still there? Okay, good, now go do this thing for me, bye! Basically sending these kids to run her cosmic errands for her. It's all worth it though, just to get those sweet, sweet Cosmo stones. These things are the main collectible of the season. It's not the cards anymore, now it's all about these stones that have the universe in them, and if they're combined, they'll destroy all of reality. Well, that escalated quickly. Honestly, I'm not a fan of these things, and I kind of wish the show just stuck to the whole rescue parents plot. Yeah, it's straightforward, but I kind of like that. Throwing these things in just feels like some arbitrary thing they did because they felt the stakes weren't high enough. That doesn't make the story more intense. It just feels forced. But now that I went over all of that, well, let's get back to talking about the story itself. Season 2 starts literally seconds after where the first season left off. Rex and the Ancients immediately return to the present, Max and Zoe are reunited with their dinosaurs, and while the parents of the D-Team are just catching up, the house is suddenly teleported away and the parents are now abducted by the Spectral Space Pirates. Hopping aboard the time machine, the D-Team now make it their mission to rescue their parents. And also the Alpha Gang comes along because come on, after they semi-reformed last season, you couldn't just leave them behind, could you? And from there, the second season pretty much has nothing to do with the first one at least in terms of structure. While the first season was a straightforward monster or dinosaur of the week show with some loose continuity just to tie the episodes together and have it all make sense for the ending, the second season is a lot more serialized, with every episode seeming to pick up immediately where the last one left off, and the whole thing feeling much more like one complete journey leading to the completion of a goal, rather than just a bunch of one-off journeys building up to something more. You'd think that this larger emphasis on serialization and telling a consistent story from beginning to end might mean that the season is stepping up its game and becoming more serious or more complex than Season 1. That is not what you get with Season 2. Instead, what you get is 30 episodes that feel like they could have been cut down to 20 episodes, with pacing problems and a lot of the episodes feeling like filler. The way this season goes is basically that the D-Team travels to a random time period, stay there for a few episodes, and then leave. They go to ancient Rome, pirate times in the Caribbean, ancient China, ancient Japan, ancient Persia, and France in the 17th century, 
and then finally the Stone Age before they at last return home. In all these time periods, they interact with various historical figures. They interact with Spartacus first, then they interact with Blackbeard, then this guy, who I don't feel like butchering the name of, so I'm just gonna call him by what the show refers to him as, and that's Sanzo Hoshi, a Shogun, a Persian princess, soon to be Queen Anne and King Louis, as well as the Three Musketeers. It's a goddamn travel log through space and time. And all that wouldn't be so bad if it didn't feel so leisurely. Like, okay, let's lay out the stakes here. These kids are trying to rescue their parents from these space pirates who also want to collect these stones for themselves. And if they get all seven, it'll annihilate the whole universe. Pretty fucking intense, right? Yet the show never really seems to approach any of this with all that much urgency. So much of the time spent in these time periods is just time spent dicking around until the plot decides it's time to advance, and then they just happen to find the stone. This isn't a quest, they're not on a mission, they're just stumbling through the story of the show. This is where the show drops the ball in regards to its serialized storytelling. You can't have these fun, cooldown episodes when the whole conceit of the story is that they're short on time and have to keep moving or else very bad things will happen. Not to mention, a lot of the characters they come across in these time periods, historical or otherwise, are just plain annoying. Yeah, some of them are okay and make for good allies to the team, but on the other hand, you have a lot of real shitters on their side that you wish they just ditch as soon as possible. One of those is Jim, a little sailor boy who they meet during their pirate leg of the journey, and his main character trait is being extremely horny and lusting after Zoe. Oh, my bad, he's a kid, so it's just called crushing at that age. Whatever you want to call it, it's gross, it's uncomfortable, I don't like watching it, and I find it hard to feel bad for him at all when he gets slapped in the face by Zoe. Twice. At least he's able to elevate another character by giving Zoe an opportunity to slap the shit out of someone. Now, if I'm forced to say something good about the season, I wouldn't be completely out of things to say. Aside from the superior action and animation, there are also a few segments I like. I liked a lot of the stuff in Ancient Japan, probably because it does something different than the previous segments. In this one, Zoe's dad is able to escape from the Space Pirates vessel and lands on Earth, forcing the kids to go after and try to find him. It's simple, but it's not all that bad of a premise. They added some humor to it, with Zoe's dad being confused for a Shogun, who happens to look exactly like him, while the D-Team ends up getting saddled with the real Shogun. Still, that gives us some nice character moments with the D-Team reflecting on how much they miss their parents. Again, I would have been fine if this was the whole season and we just forgot about the stupid Cosmo Stones, but alas, we still have those stones to deal with, and they don't even get Zoe's dad by the end. It was fun while it lasted. I also like some of the stuff in Persia. There, we get to meet a Persian princess who has just discovered a dinosaur that she confuses for and refers to as a genie. And while that's nice and wholesome and whatever, it's a little unfortunate that we have a part of the show set in a Middle Eastern country with a dinosaur named Isisaurus. Yeah, that's a bit of a stretch, I know. Anyway, the stuff in Persia isn't the best, but it's all worth it for the episode Malice in the Palace. This is just a fun old palace raid. Lots of action, lots of humor, lots of fun, a good send-off to the Persia segment. Probably my favorite episodes of the season are Bad Deal and the Forest Fire Effect. These episodes involve the crew traveling back to the Jurassic period, the deal with Seth, and later a whole forest fire starting. And when they come back to the present, the whole city is swarming with plants and giant insects. The reason they give being that the one forest fire ended up having an immense impact on the course of history through some shit that Ed explains, and now we have giant plants and insects ruling the world. It's honestly a really cool idea, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. As in this universe, the effects of time travel can only be felt in the present. As in they literally start infiltrating the world, rather than reality as the characters know it collapsing in order to make way for the new reality. I maybe understand since the D-Team are time traveling the whole time, but how are Reese and the others still here? Shouldn't they have been erased from existence by now? Still, these episodes are a lot of fun and would have served as a pretty decent finale, but instead we get the final three episodes, and they are... fine. I was surprised by us actually getting to see the Cosmo Stones merge together, and the results were certainly impressive. A giant black pterosaur that starts sucking the world dry and tearing it apart is certainly a cool image, but we're just kind of getting what we got last time with another dark or black thing that the characters have to 
band together against, except not as interesting here, and that last minute redemption by Seth. Once again, doesn't feel earned, and seems kind of shoehorned in. And even the very end of this feels the exact same as the last season. No, really. After the big bad has been defeated, Rex, the Ancients, and the Alpha Gang go back to their rightful time period, the D-Team says goodbye to their dinosaurs, and that's it. It's the exact same ending, and this actually reflects worse on the whole season than you might think. By having the season end exactly where it started, and exactly where the first season ended, it communicates the idea to the audience that the last 30 episodes they just watched were fucking pointless. Then again, maybe it was. After all, they only saved the entirety of the multiverse. Always a great feeling to leave your audience with that what they just watched was a waste of time when that's what was accomplished. Alright, so if it wasn't obvious enough, my thoughts about the show vary pretty heavily from season to season, so... I'm actually going to split this final conclusion segment into two parts. First, let's talk about Season 1. For what it is, I actually think that Dinosaur King's first season isn't all that bad. While it definitely suffers from some of the limitations posed on it for being a kid's show, it still managed to entertain me and wasn't overly cringeworthy or hard to watch. What's great about it is that while it is a show ostensibly just about dinosaurs beating the crap out of each other, it offers more entertainment value beyond that. As said, the dinosaur fights weren't even my favorite part of this season. I was getting into the story and the characters and the world first, dinosaur battles second. The characters themselves, while somewhat basic, are still fun to watch. I enjoy their interactions with each other, and some of them could even be genuinely funny, sweet, even intimidating. Some grew on me with time, others I liked from the get-go, and some I wasn't a big fan of all the way through. but. They weren't enough to ruin the show. The dinosaurs themselves are presented well, with the show seemingly going out of its way to make them seem like more than just props and actually have some character in their own right. Also, I haven't mentioned this enough, but the baby forms of the dinosaurs are all friggin' adorable in this show. The animation on the humans, while nothing special, isn't terrible, and the animation on the dinosaurs is actually pretty good and fairly well integrated into the 2D environments. The show's writing can get a bit stupid at times, but even then it can be kind of fun to laugh at, not something you just want to slam your desk in frustration at, and when the writers really commit to giving us a worthwhile story, they can certainly deliver. Overall, I was surprised. I was not expecting to enjoy this show as much as I did, but I actually found it pretty good. And before anyone says, Oh, you watched it when you were a kid, of course your expectations were skewed. Well, yeah, but not in the way you might think. Because for a time, I hated this show. I thought it was stupid and terrible. I thought I was too good for it, so on and so forth. So maybe revisiting the show for this review, I did have my expectations skewed, but more so in the sense that I thought it was just gonna be really bad and then was surprised when it wasn't than just forgiving all its problems simply for nostalgia's sake. Looking back, I was too hard on the show when I was younger and anyone looking at it thinking it's just a silly kid show with no substance well, you're right in that it's a silly kid show, but I'm gonna have to disagree on the no substance part. Because for my money, this is a decent show, and if you can look past or embrace some of the sillier, goofy kid show aspects of it, you can actually have a good time. Season 2, on the other hand, is a lot messier and a lot less consistent, with some pretty bad pacing problems, sidelining of characters who deserve it better, introducing new characters that don't measure up, and some rehashing. It pretty much ticks all the right boxes for what makes a bad follow-up. Strangely, although I will concede that the season does fall short of its predecessor, it's still not the worst thing I've seen. The old characters they don't shove away for this season are still just as endearing as ever, and some of the new characters are alright. The time travel aspect offers some fun possibilities that are sometimes taken advantage of, and other times not. The action sequences are really great, probably the main thing the season has over the first. It's not terrible, it's just a bit disappointing. After the pleasant surprise I had with Season 1, maybe I just expected a bit more from this season than I should've. Like, it's Dinosaur King Season 2, what was I really expecting? But I really liked the first season, and I was hoping that if the season had to exist, which I really don't think it did, I think the first season had a decent ending set up already, but if things just couldn't end here, why not at least try to top the first season, or at least learn from it? Instead, it just feels like a bunch of padding in different time periods, mixed in with stuff we already saw from the last season, only done much worse here. Overall, it's a mixed bag. I guess if I had to sum it all up, I'd say... I just wish it was missing a third of the episodes. 
Now, I usually don't hand out letter or number grades for my videos. I think it's a little unnecessary seeing as how you can usually glean my thoughts on something pretty easily, but for this show, I was quite all over the place, so I'll try to get my thoughts down to a single number out of 10. Or two, since I'm panning out one per season. With that said, I give Dinosaur King Season 1 a 7 out of 10, and I give Dinosaur King Season 2 a 5 out of 10. Hopefully you came away with a better understanding of this show, or at least my personal feelings about it. This was a lot of fun to make, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. So, um, yeah. Not really much else to say here. Ah, what the hell, give me the theme one more time. Dinosaur King is what you wanna be, yeah. Make your move, come on and make your move. Dinosaur King is your destiny, yeah. Make your move, come on and make your move. See ya! The past is in the present. Times been twisted upside down. These fossils are colossal. Only one can wear the crown. Dinosaur King is what you wanna be, yeah.